Mr. Mike Serino is going to bring the word today. God bless you, brother. God bless you. Thank you. What up, Journey? How are y'all doing? Give me a second. I got to get this set up. Adrian said this would make me teach better, so we'll see. <laughs> All right. So um, it seems like every time I'm up here, it's like uh, a... Uh, military holiday weekend, right? Seems like Memorial Day I'm up here. Now it's Veterans Day weekend. I'm up here again, right? It seems like that's the only time I get up here. But all kidding aside, uh, Pastor, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to come up here and be a part of this series in Revelation. And hasn't it been great already? Like, hasn't it just been amazing, right? If you, uh, if you haven't gotten enough of this series after uh, we get done with this and you want to dig in more, I encourage you, continue to dig into this book. Continue to look what it has for you, all right? Continue to go after that. And uh, if that's not enough for you, uh, I'm a little secret out. We're going to have a small group next semester that's going to go over the book of Revelation. So you could come in there and we're going to go in much deeper during that gr uh, small group than what we were able to go in in this, uh, in this series. Is the mic good? All right. Um, so I encourage you, stay on the lookout for that. Uh, before we go any further, let's pray. Father God, uh, first off, I want to give you thanks. Thanks for who you are, Father. Uh, thank you for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do, Father. We give you all the glory. I pray that you give us ears to hear as we go through this book today, Father, what you have for us. I, I pray that you give us eyes to see what it is that you want us to see, Father God. And we just give you all the glory in your precious and holy name. Amen, amen, and amen. So let's do a little recap. Uh, we started off with Jim. He opened up uh, the series and told us how it's the book of Revelation, right? There's no S in there. And it wasn't just to be funny, but it's true because it is only one revelation. And that's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he also told us this very important thing that's inside of chapter 1. It says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. For the time is near. That's so important because that's the only book that you're going to find in the Bible where there's a blessing just to read it, just to study it. Amen? And then Pastor Joey shared a brief timeline overview um, of the book of Revelation from chapter 24 in the book of Matthew. Um, extra homework for you. Take, the book of, take chapter 24 in the book of Matthew. Put it with chapter 6 in the book of Revelation and study them together. It will blow your mind how much that they are identical, all right? This was a great example of when you study the book of Revelation, you need to study every other part of the Bible, right? You have to study every other part of the Bible. Revelation, uh, when you study it, Revelation brings it all together. It brings the rest of the Bible together. So many things are said in Revelation throughout the entire Bible that really make the words that are inside of the book make sense. Does that make sense? All right. Then Pastor Adam brought a great message on the letters that we find in chapters 2 and 3. He specifically talked about Thyatira, which is the one that has the Jezebel spirit, and how we need to shed that spirit from among us. Pastor Eric brought a word, um, and, he, and he reassured us and told us that there is none other than Jesus who is worthy to open the seals, right? None other than Jesus is worthy to open the seals. But he also reassured us and he told us, you know, no matter what, no matter how bad things may be getting down here, no matter what it may look like, rest assured, God is still on the throne, right? God is still on the throne and he's still in control. And then last week, Pastor Eric brought an amazing teaching, right, on Revelation 12 and 13, uh, which he talked about the Antichrist and specifically how he talked about how the setup for the mark of the beast you can see in this day and age, right? Since that message, I've had people say, well, you know, that's what they said about credit cards and all these other things, right? That that's going to be the mark of the beast. That has nothing to do with your body, all right? I mean, if you think about the mark of the beast, it's a mark on your hand, right? Your right hand or on your forehead that deals with your body. I don't believe the vaccine is the mark of the beast, but you can see that is something that is going into your body and that's the setup for the mark of the beast at a later time, right? Amen. So we've gone over all this stuff, and it leads us to today. I'm a preference. What I'm talking about today, these events are future events that are going to happen. This isn't things that we've missed out on so far. These are future events. Once you get past chapters 2 and 3 in Revelation, you're looking at future events that are to come during the end times, during the tribulation. So Revelation 17 through 19 is what I get to cover today. 
which is like six months worth of material that they've given me about 25 minutes to go over. So I'm going to feed you like a fire hose right now with a bunch of information that I can go over. We are definitely not going to cover all of it, but I'm going to try and hit the most important parts that I believe are inside of there. Um, you have chapter 17, which is the great prostitute and the beast. You have chapter 18, which is the fall of Babylon. You have chapter 19, which starts off with the rejoicing in heaven. Then it goes to the marriage supper of the lamb. And then it goes to the rider on the white horse. And then we're going to talk about just the beginning of Revelation 20, which is the locking away of the ancient serpent, which is such a great, great verse. There's so much material, like I said, and just not enough time to go over all of it. So we've been going over this overall arching series this whole year, right? And if you missed it, I, I, I really urge you to go back and listen to them, of war in the heavens. You see, this war that we've been talking about is a real war. This is really going on around you, right? in the spiritual realm. And this is a, uh, a real war, and just like real wars in the natural, there are multiple, multiple battles that happen. Multiple battles. And those battles started all the way back in chapter 3 of Genesis, when the father of lies deceived Adam and Eve, and sin entered the world at that time. Those battles have been going on throughout the entire history, throughout the entire Bible. It goes on today, all the way up into the point where we find ourselves in chapter 19 at the very end of what we're going to talk about today. So just like in the Bible, there are certain battles in our life that Satan thinks he's winning, right? He thinks he's winning, but ultimately, today we're going to see who wins that war, right? Battles may go to either side, but there's only one that's going to ultimately win the war, and we're going to find out who that is today. Let me ask you a question. Does Satan actually win battles in our lives in this world today? Do you think he's winning some battles? I would argue and say that he does, right? I would argue and say that Satan, he might think he's winning some of these battles. Revelation 13 tells us this. Pastor Eric shared it. He's, it says, the beast was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, right? You see, Satan may win some battles, but it's only because God is allowing it to happen. And in our mind, in our earthly mind, we cannot understand that at all. We don't understand why God can allow some of these things to happen, some of these battles to allow Satan to get, right? But God's plans are so much better than any one of our plans in here, right? His timing is so much better than any of our timing because our timing's horrible. We always want it now, 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 right? But his timing is so much better, and I'm so grateful for that. I mean, just look at what happened with my accident. There was many people that I got to witness to that I never would have been able to witness to. There's many people that have heard things that I will never get to meet. My parents were saved through this process. I had the honor to baptize them through this process. But most importantly, I get to preach and teach more than I ever have since the accident, right? What, what Satan has meant for evil, God turned that around on his head stomped him and turned it for good right he turned it for good but look at the world that we live in right now satan's winning the battle of fear he's winning that battle of fear if half the church can disappear during coven what do you think is going to happen during the end times with about the things that we're talking about and about the things that we're going to talk about today what's going to happen you see we don't do these message series um, these type of messages to instill a fear onto you, right? We teach, we want to teach what it's going to be like. We want to show you what it's really going to be like so we can prepare you for those end times, for what's coming down the road. He's winning the battle of social distancing. Probably the worst word we could have used, right? Social distancing. The battle of division. You see that all over the place, all over. But most importantly, I think, he's winning the battle for attention right? He's getting so much attention, right? How much attention do you put into things that's not of Jesus, that you shouldn't be putting your attention into? I'm here to tell you, Jesus should not and shall not take second place to nobody, to nothing at all, period. Pastor Adam talked about that Jezebel spirit a couple weeks ago and how we need to shed that spirit, right? If you look at another, um, another one of the churches that a letter was written to in chapters 2 and 3, um, you find the church of Laodicea. It had, a, 
it had a letter written to them and it said um, how they were lukewarm and if they were going to be lukewarm that he was going to spit them out of his mouth. How much of that can you see today, the lukewarm, right, the lukewarm Christianity that's going around? I'm going to tell you a little backstory about Laodicea and why that word is so important to understand. In America, we don't understand not having cold water. You go to the faucet, you turn on cold water. We understand not having hot water sometimes, right? But cold water, you go to the faucet, turn it on, it's cold. You go to the fridge, get some water, it's cold. If it's not cold enough, you get some ice. You put in that water, right? I mean, there's water's always cold. Laodicea, why it's so important, why it's so funny what he wrote to them. Laodicea got their water from two different sources, from two different towns. It was ducked into them. They got hot water from one hot spring area, went through the ducts, cooled down into this tempid, lukewarm water. It got cold water from another town, heated up into this tempid water. When it met in the middle, it was lukewarm. Laodicea understood what lukewarm water was, and they understood what it meant to be spit out of his mouth. So just like the war on earth, just because Satan may be winning some battles does not mean that he's going to win the war, right? In the natural, we don't know who's going to win that war, right? We go into these wars, and we don't know. We see the battles. We play it out, right? But we will never know who's going to ultimately win that war. I'm going to tell you a secret. We know who wins the spiritual war. Amen? We know who's going to win that spiritual war. So I talked about Revelation 13, right? So in contrast to that, it said, the beast was allowed to make war on the saints and conquer them. But now if you look at Revelation 17, 14, which I think is one of the best scriptures that are in the book of Revelation and the Bible period, I could literally read this scripture, just roll away, and we're done for the day. Right? But I'm going to do some more teaching if that's all right. It says this, They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and those with him are called, chosen, and faithful. You see, they're going to make war on the Lamb, but the Lamb is going to overcome. The one who is worthy to open the seals is going to conquer them. Amen? Amen. Amen. But what I think gets overlooked and what's so important is the last part of that scripture. It says those that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Who are those people that are with him? Right? Where did they go to be with him? How did they get to be with him? Who are these people? Right? So in order to answer that question, you need to look at the timeline in Revelation and go over it. Now, I'm going to preference this with what I'm talking about now is future events, right? You haven't missed out on anything yet. This is things that are to come in Scripture. So if you haven't noticed, none of us that have been up here talking have really touched on the subject of the rapture. And that's done on purpose because it doesn't matter, right? It's going to happen. It's going to happen, but I don't want you looking forward to the rapture. You should be looking forward to Jesus. And Jesus only is who you should be looking forward to, right? So we should be fixing our eyes on when Jesus and when Jesus only is going to be coming. It doesn't matter where you think it happens because it will happen, right? In this scripture, it tells us it will happen. I'm not going to talk about exactly when the rapture happens because in these chapters of Revelation, we find ourselves at the very end of the seven-year tribulation period, all right? So at this point in scripture, in these future events, it doesn't matter if you're a pre-tribber, if you're a mid-trib, if you're post-trib, if you're pre-wrath, if you're like Pastor Eric and he's pan, it'll all pan out, right? It doesn't matter what you are at this point because in these future events, the rapture has already happened. Those who are called, those who are chosen, those who are faithful have been taken from this world to be with Jesus forever. If you have no idea what I just said and you're like, I don't know what you're talking about, Revelation class next semester is for you, all right? Come to that class, we're going to dig into that, and you're going to learn exactly what that means. So how do I know that in these future events, right, that we're talking about, how do I know that the rapture has already happened at this point in Revelation 17 through 19? Well, if you look at Matthew 24, which is what Pastor Joey talked about, you can read this. It says, in verses 30 through 31, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. 
And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, look at Revelation 14. Which Revelation 14 is a chapter that we skipped over, right? We did 12 and 13 last week. We're doing 17 through 19 now. So 14 is part of that homework that I hope you guys read over. All right? So what you see in there in Revelation 14 is this. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on that cloud like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come. For the harvest of the earth is fully ripe, so he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. So as you can see, the rapture, the gathering, the reaping, the harvest, whatever you want to call that, it's complete. At this point in Scripture, in those future events, it is complete. That is how we get to where he is. That is how they are there. He came back for them. Amen? He came back for them. He came for you and me. So the ones who are called, chosen, and faithful are those that have given their life to Jesus. Those that have become a follower of the one true King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Those are the ones that have been raptured, gathered, reaped from the earth. That is you and me in here today if that was to happen in a future event down the road, right? That have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if you're sitting in here and you don't have that relationship with him, you are here for a reason and for a purpose. You have been called and chosen by him to be here to hear this today. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. Listen to what he is saying to you today. At the end of this message, we're going to have the prayer team down here. All right? Come down here in the front, pray with them, and they can give you those next steps in your walk with Jesus. Because when you put all your faith, hope, and trust into Jesus, you get invited to something super special at the end. So what is this super special, amazing thing that, that you get invited to? I'm glad you asked me. All right. So in chapter 19 of Revelation, we see the marriage supper of the Lamb. Many of us, many of us in here may have not even gotten to this point yet, because sometimes we don't like to study the book of Revelation because it's scary. Or we get here and we just don't understand what this means. If you just read over the marriage supper of the Lamb, you'll actually miss out on something truly amazing with what's going on because you have to know the customs of the day to understand the words that he is using so let's read it and then we'll talk about it we're going to be reading a lot of scripture today i hope you don't mind all right so then i heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude like the roar of many waters and like the sound of a mighty peals of thunder crying out hallelujah for the lord our god the almighty reigns let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers. You hold to the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. Wow, right? That's a lot in there, right? You see you get invited to this super amazing supper at the end times. But what is this marriage supper that we're talking about? What makes it so special? So the marriage supper of the Lamb is this symbolic representation of this joyful, intimate, eternal fellowship that takes place between Jesus Christ, the Lamb, and then his bride, which is the church. This future picture of a great wedding feast is drawn from both Old Testament and New Testament imagery. You can see it throughout the entire Bible. So the Old Testament writers often used weddings, uh, brides, bridegrooms, marriage unions, as powerful illustrative resources. You can see the nation of Israel was frequently likened to the wife of God by the prophets. And then Israel, over and over and over and over again, when it broke her covenant, 
right? Vows with God, she was compared to a wayward, unfaithful wife who had broken her marriage contract. And then the development of the Lamb of God, where we get that as imagery for the Messiah, also began in the Old Testament, when you can see frequent animal sacrifices. So in the story of Abraham and Isaac, the Lord provides that sacrificial lamb, that foreshadowing God's sacrifice, right, of his only son, Jesus Christ, on that cross, on Calvary's cross for our sins, for all of our sins, that rescue that we all needed. The book of Isaiah, which we talked about just recently in our Bible class that Pastor was talking about, describes the suffering servant as a lamb led to the slaughter. So that's that Old Testament imagery. And now New Testament, you can see when John the Baptist first sees Jesus, he declares, behold, the Lamb of God. The earliest Christians believed Jesus was that suffering servant in Isaiah. Paul describes Jesus as the Passover lamb. And Peter explains that believers are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb who was without blemish or spot, that perfect once for all time sacrifice. So that's the lamb. And likewise with the marriage imagery or the wedding imagery, it expands and it's made complete in the New Testament. It's kind of funny how Jesus' first miracle was at a wedding feast, right? Just like the marriage supper of the lamb, his first miracle was at a wedding feast. John the Baptist calls Jesus the bridegroom. And Jesus himself often speaks of the kingdom of God in the, in the terms of a joyous wedding feast. And then Paul brings it together in Ephesians when he, when he explains the relationship between a husband and wife is just like that of Jesus with the church, right? So why did I talk about all this stuff in the Bible and give you all this imagery, right? It's to drive home the point that you can't talk about Revelation without touching every single book in the Bible. You can't, you can't just study Revelation and not know or look at any other part of the Bible. It brings it all together. They are all linked together and it all comes together in the book of Revelation. Many of us in here like to read, right? It'd be like picking up a new book, going to the last chapter and reading that chapter. You'd be completely lost. You'd just be like, I don't know what's going on because you have no backstory of the other chapters of the book. It just isn't going to make sense. So now that cultural, that historical context that I was talking about, which brings it truly to a miracle of what was said during these, these verses. So fully understand the imagery of the marriage supper of the Lamb, it's essential to consider the context, the history, historical context of this. The weddings and the culture at the time of Christ. For a Jewish couple, right, to enter into matrimony, they had to go through this multiple phase process. So the initial part was, right, the, the signing of the marriage contract, which was then executed by the parents of both the bride and the groom. The groom's family would pay this dowry to the bride's family, sealing the engagement. As such, the official engagement period would begin at that point. And then the engagement was bound by the terms of that marriage contract. But during this period, right, they were not able to live together. They did not live together at all. They didn't have any intimate relationships with each other, nothing like that at all. The, bro the um, groom actually went away to prepare a place for the bride. Then after the initial engagement, a wedding procession would take place from the bride's house, who was the bride that we talked about, right? Think about that. The bride's house to the bridegroom's house. For this celebration, the bride would make herself ready to receive her groom. We just read about that in Revelation 19, right? In the marriage of the Lamb. What did it say? It said, and his bride has made herself ready. The final phase of this wedding ceremony ended in this great feast, the marriage supper, which could last several days. I can't wait to get to heaven for this marriage supper to happen so I can eat, right? Several days this feast is going to happen. The imagery reaches its final climactic stage in the book of Revelation. The marriage supper of the Lamb marks the end of this long engagement period between Christ and the church. And the beginning of an eternal, unbroken fellowship of love, right? Of love. John refers to Christ as the lamb who was slain, who shed his blood, and who overcame death and the devil. Jesus is the victorious lamb who conquers through self-sacrifice. Jesus Christ the lamb is the bridegroom, and the church is the bride. The marriage supper of the lamb, a great and joyous celebration, comes to this glorious climax in Revelation 21, 
when you see the new heavens and the new earth. But I'm going to leave it there as a cliffhanger because they're going to talk about that in later weeks and I don't want to steal their thunder. So come back next week for that, that talk on those. So look at this. Out of all that, right, that history context, you take the marriage supper of the Lamb, the groom goes away for a period and then comes back for the bride. Look at John 14, 1 through 3. This will blow your mind. You've probably read this multiple times, but now look at it after reading the backstory. And now we know the history and the context of a marriage supper. It says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. He's coming back for the bride. He's coming back. Yeah, get happy. That bride is you and me sitting in here today. Those that have put their faith, their hope, their trust into Jesus Christ. And call him Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Amen. Amen. Lord, come quickly, please. So what happens right after the marriage supper of the Lamb? Well, great things for those who... Uh, Call them the, who are called and chosen and faithful, but not so much for those that are not called or chosen or faithful. It's pretty bad. Like Pastor Eric talked about, I'm not trying to instill a, a spirit of fear. I don't want you to make a, a commitment based off of a fear or anything like that. That's not what I want. I want to show you what is going to happen in the end times and return, give glory to God. And in doing so, pray, pray that many will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because in the end time, so many people are going to fall away. If you don't believe me, yet again in Matthew 25, verse 10, it says, And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And how much of that can you see going on? I don't want that to be you. I want to show you what it's going to be like and let God work on you from there. So let's look at this. This is right after the marriage supper of the Lamb. 19, 11 through 21. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and, is, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Remember what it said in the marriage supper of the Lamb about those arrayed in fine linen? That's the bride. That's you and me in these future events, right? We get to come back with him. So from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Does Jesus have a tattoo? Never mind, never mind, never mind. We ain't going there. We ain't got enough time. Not enough time, not enough time. We got chili to eat. All right. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead. This is where it gets bad for those who are not called and chosen and faithful. Come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of the captains, the flesh of the mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of the fire that burns with sulfur and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. What a gruesome and gruesome scene. But you and I are coming back with Jesus when he comes. Back once and for all to rule and reign forever. But look it, you come back unarmed. You don't have a weapon. The only weapon mentioned in there is the sword that Jesus has. Because that war is going to be over like that. 
right? Like that, because they will make war, but he will overcome. They will make war, and he will overcome. Let's look at the first three verses in chapter 20. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. Every time I read that, I chuckle. It makes me laugh. You want to know why? Because it's the rookie angel that's going down to lock away the devil. Think about it. It's the rookie. I can just see God going, hey, you, here's the keys. Here, go lock him away, please. It doesn't say Jesus, it doesn't say Michael, it doesn't say Gabriel that locked him away, just an angel. So if Satan isn't as powerful as just an angel, he is no match for the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, right? He is no match for them. And you and I are going to be right there with them to watch it all unfold. And I can't wait. I cannot wait. How glorious is that? So when you are having those rough times, those rough days, when those battles seem so intense that you can't overcome it, remember, he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords, and you're right there with him. He's right there with you. If he is for us, who could ever on this earth be against us, right? Who could ever be against us? Rise. Go ahead and rise and close your eyes. As we close today and get ready to leave, I urge you to remember what you have heard today. That we look forward to, as believers, this marriage supper of the Lamb that we get to participate in. If you are here today and you don't have that relationship, that personal relationship with Jesus, if you have fallen away from Him, I urge you to come down front. Our prayer team is going to be down here. Come down to the front right now. Don't wait. Come let them pray with you so they can give you those next steps with your walk with Jesus. For all the rest of us in here, I want you to remember you are called, you are chosen, you are faithful, you are here for a reason, and God has guided you here for a time as this. I can tell you Jesus is coming back for his bride. We may not know the day, the time, the hour, the minutes, but we do know the season when he's coming back. And if you look at the day and age that we're living in, that season looks more and more like it's getting closer and closer and closer. We are called to continue to look for him in everything that we do. Continue to go after the lost because I want all of us in here every day to be able to say, hell lost another one. I want you to be able to say, hell lost another one because God gained another one. Amen. Journey, continue to witness, spread the gospel because that is what we are called to do on a daily basis. Don't wrap your head around when this rapture is going to happen or anything like that. Wrap your head around who am I supposed to go after today, Lord? Who is it that you want me to reach today, Lord? Father, give us the strength Give us the courage to continue going after those that are hurting and lost. Give us the strength to keep fighting even when these battles seem like we can't overcome them, Father. Remind us who is there with us. Father, guide us. Give us the wisdom to seek after those who you seek after. Give us a heart after you, Father. Father, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The battles may be tough, but ultimately we know that they are going to make war on the Lamb, but the Lamb is going to overcome because He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And those that are with Him are chosen. They are called. They are faithful. Father, we love You. We give You all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Don't miss out on the opportunity. Come up here to the prayer team. Let them pray with you. Don't miss out on that. Um, this concludes the message for today, Journey. Uh, we have chili that's outside. I urge you to go out there and eat some chili. Uh, get your fill of it. And then uh, live your life to make a difference in the lives of others. Amen. Put your hands together for Mike. Didn't he do a great job bringing the word of God today?
Hey, a couple of instructions. We'd love for you to stay and hang out as Mike just shared. So if you want to pick up your children, meet us out there. We've got hot dogs. We've got chili. We've got a little tailgating action going on. So we encourage you to hang out, make some new friends, enjoy a little bit of this cool weather out there. God bless you guys. Hope to see you out there.